in three, two, one, start. Start up corner. Let's get it started in here. Once upon a time, we used to say, "What a man can do, a woman can do better," and I think that's laid back right now. At the moment, it's more about women leading the pack and men trying to play catch up. This may sound quite strange to you, but that's what you get on Startup Corner. Today's guest on Startup Corner is someone who is quite empathetic in a personality. And when you're empathetic in your boss or CEO of a, of a company, how do you deal with staff when they are not performing to the optimum? You're kind because you're empathetic, but you have to deal with that. So she tries to bring logic behind every decision she makes and tries to balance without assassinating her empathetic character. I'm talking about the founder and CEO of Mom Spring, Abisola Tulu Udutola. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? Are you sure you're doing great? I have a bit of a cold, but I'm doing great. Yes. Okay. <laughs> cold is doing great. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to the show this time. All right. Um, let's talk about you a little bit. I mean, if someone sees you, judging the book by the cover, what are the things that people have said to you about you that you thought, well, that's not true, but maybe it's just appearance, deceptive stuff? Um, I think most people are surprised that I have a technical background. They assume that I'm a... Um, I'm, oh, I studied business administration and or the arts, but I have a background in electrical engineering and a master's in engineering as well. So people are usually kind of amazed that um, I have such a technical background and that I understand tech. They usually expect, you know, I'm just a mommy and, um, yeah. Well, I'm not, my name is not people, but I, I'm kind of amazed too, you know, that you're in, in the tech. And not just in the tech, electrical engineering, you know. Uh, the last few bit of engineers that I've seen, female, they always have the boot, the trainers, the jeans, and all of that. But you're not that kind of person. Yes. So I, I'm, in terms of appearance, I appear yeah. very feminine. Yeah. And um, but when it comes to business, I'm just as logical as the next guy. Interesting. All right, that's on the facade side of things. Uh, on the inner side of things, how do people misunderstand your intention? Hmm. So being a a CEO um, in Nigeria can be interesting because in terms of staff, there's in general a healthy distrust for management because staff usually thinks that management is out to get them or out to um, punish them if they're not perfect. So many times I find that staff doesn't really open up when they're struggling with things or they're not able to get tasks done. They just find a way to cover up or to make it seem as though the deadline wasn't clear. And it, I think one of the biggest challenges has been just trying to create a culture of openness where it's okay, if it's not working out, just tell me. If you feel like you're failing, let's find a way to fix it. In a startup, I think it's important for everybody to get comfortable with failing because you will try things and assume based on the numbers that they would work. And then in reality, the customers don't bite or um, the market conditions change. Things change, but it's important that you can identify quickly that it's not working out and adapt. So in the early days when um, team members wouldn't quickly r raise an alarm if they felt like a project they were working on wasn't going quite right, that was very challenging but I think very quickly what my team has now realized is for me communication is more critical than success or failure I just need to know what's happening so that we can make the right decisions at the right time empathetic all right um, as an entrepreneur um, newborn and mat um, maternal health advocate what has been the most difficult situation you had to deal with as on the advocacy side and as an entrepreneur so on the advocacy side, um, one of the most challenging things is just seeing how how widespread and vast the problem is and how um, debilitating it's been for different organizations to kind of make any meaningful progress uh, in that front. So um, just to shed more light, so there's child mortality, which is where children under age five die. 
within that, there's a subset called neonatal mortality, which is when a child that is less than a month old dies. So um, child mortality has been reducing steadily, but neonatal mortality hasn't because there's many factors that contribute to neonatal mortality. Some of it is being born preterm. And if you're, if a child is born preterm, they need to have access to certain kinds of medical care, which is um, available in a neonatal ICU. Neonatal ICUs are not that many in Nigeria right now. I mean, even in private hospitals, they don't have enough equipment um, for their neonatal ICUs. So that's that already puts a woman who's having a baby in Nigeria who happens to be preterm at a high risk of losing that child. Another thing, another potential um, cause is infection that happens at birth. Um, basically what happens is during delivery, many women, more than half of the births that happen in Nigeria are not happening in a medical facility today due to different reasons. Some of it is cultural, some of it is socioeconomic affordability and access. So women who are living in rural areas and women who are living in cities, in Lagos, on the island, um, in certain areas um, that you would not expect because maybe right five minutes away is a very rich estate or neighborhood. And just around the corner, there's a woman who cannot afford to pay um, the less than $20 that it costs to access antenatal care. So this woman is having her baby at home many times by herself, using just tools around the house. So what um, what the WHO re- re- recommends is that these women at least have access to a safe birth kit, which can essentially avoid infection during delivery. Because the reality is, ideally, we want them to have their babies in hospitals. But even the medical care in Nigeria is overwhelmed, the medical um, health care system. So the reality is many of these women will still probably have their babies at home. But it's now about making sure they have what they need to prevent um, infections, which is one of the top three leading causes of death in newborns. So it's it's a complicated problem, and it's a many-faceted problem. So, for example, imagine a woman who's having a child that's preterm having their baby at home. So that's two, two potential risks at the same time. If that child is born and is needing extra support in terms of medical facility, and the woman is in a rural area or does not even have access to a car, or there's nobody at home to help her, then there's a high likelihood that that child is going to lose his or her life. So the to answer your question, um, the challenge there is just the the many the many different infrastructural things that it would take to completely solve the problem sometimes can feel overwhelming. Um, today, what the Monstering Foundation does is we provide kits to these women so at least they can have an infection-free birth. But Long term, over the next 10 years, by 2030 at least, we need to make sure we can not just help these women by giving them kids. They need to even be able to have, even if it's a midwife, attend to them. So if they have an emergency, there's a way to quickly get to the hospital. Then it means the hospitals also need to be able to have the right equipment to help these women. So it's it's huge. Yeah, I'm thinking. <laughs> as, as I hear you say this right now, I, I, first I was going to ask, does this, can I call you a social entrepreneur? That's who I am. That's what you are. Yes, Great. That's what I am. Now, now, um, when you're saying this about, you know, I'm thinking, I'm seeing what I call baby pods. Baby pods, baby yeah. Baby pods, you know, baby pod in different communities, mm-hmm. you know, where uh, pregnant women, uh, you just get there. If you write that down, they're going to pay for it. You, <laughs> that's you right. know, I, that's, I just love. Um, working with other entrepreneurs because everything is an opportunity to make some money, isn't it? So. It is. It is, but it's okay. It's good. It's good. So, Baby Pod, anyway, because you're already doing it, and I think it's a great thing to share this idea with you. Uh, Baby Pod, where, you know, the mother, the suspectants can just walk into that place and just deliver the baby. It's not a hospital, it's not a maternity center, it's not any of all those things. It's just a Baby Pod. Just come, have safe delivery. All the kids are there. The midwife you mentioned earlier is there. Is there. So, we've Okay, so with this idea, we've talked about it um, in our team. I mean, we've had a different name for it. Okay. But basically, we wanted it. But this for this to work, it would have to be in not just the local government areas, but even like the the little communities. Exactly. So where they have their community centers or where it's really, it's literally like a five-minute walk for each woman. Um, but then, the, I mean, you need to have thousands of those. 
course. first of all. And but then it would it could it would also create jobs for many of these midwives because many of the midwives that we've spoken to, some of them sometimes struggle to get clients. So it's some are even retired. And, yeah, and some are retired tired. and they are not tired. Yes, some of them are retired nurses and they're just looking for work to do. So it would give them automatic work to do. So this is a um a, a potential um direction that we could take with it. And we've been we've been talking about it and how what it would take to implement such a thing. In in my fictional mind, yes. What I see, this baby pod will be linked to the Momspring app. Yes. Such that every birth is tracked on the app. A lot of things are automated, you know, in the baby pod that has to do with the app. Don't ask me to be a part of your team, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> so the, the, it's funny enough, the, it's the really interesting thing is, so we've, because right now our app, our app is a smartphone app, but we've been, we're working already on an SMS um, powered app or, or a USSD app, which is more likely to work for, so you have different women. Some women use smartphones. Many of the, I think about probably close to 60% of the women in Nigeria are not using smartphones. Of course, of course. So to be able to reach all the women, we need to have both kinds of apps. So yes, for that to really work, it's when we have those two. So that no matter whether you're a smartphone user or a, a non-smartphone, I don't, what do you call a non-smartphone now? A non-smartphone user. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> or a non-smartphone user, you can basically get that access. You can, uh, we can track your pregnancy because you, pre- so for this baby, now we're going, we got with your name. Um, for this baby pod yeah. thing to work well, we basically need to have the women registered, so that way we're we're kind of knowing that okay, in September we're expecting, you know, three hundred births, so yeah. you can have enough kids, have enough supplies, yeah. and but yeah, that's that's where it, that's where it's going to go eventually. I mean, we we start we started today with the kids, and it's a way to also kind of understand the needs of the women, understand their mindsets, understand if they're even open to the care. Or if it's a mostly a cultural thing, but really what we found is it's mostly a financial decision um, and a, any privacy decision as to whether to have their babies in a clinic or at home. So and then, but the fact that the pods <laughs> will be near where they live, oh, it makes okay. it very accessible. Yeah, I really like the name to be yeah, honest. Cool. The name we came up with was a little more serious. Yeah. So this baby pod is kind of cute. So, <laughs> you know, now Abisola, I feel like I owe you an apology. An apology for not properly really introducing you properly. Okay. Because I, I know a lot about you that I've not said in introducing you. Ooh. So, uh, but I'm going to just pick some random aspect of them. No problem. You know, that we can work on right now on this show. Um, Momspring Foundation is there. Yes. The Momspring app is there. Yes. You just mentioned the USSD app version yes. of the Momspring we, we, app we'll right now. We call it something different, but yes. Yeah, you yes. know. And then, of course, um, the Momspring retail online store yes is there yes you know and then so we've got the mastering retail concept i will call it okay it's um there's an, there's a couple of online stores is in monstering.com which is for africa and then there's monstering.co.uk which is for europe and then we had for a, for about 10 months um, a brick and mortar store as well under the retail all right now at this point in time let's get into your story let's oh. let's reel back yes to the beginning uh-huh. and how you began Mom Spring. Okay. What, what what brought you into it? You know, mm-hmm. and then what it started as, and how it you know matured how evolved. into all of these things. Okay. Tell the story. Profile the business. Keep the money. Startup corner. So Mom Spring started out um, when I was well. The need for Mom Spring started out when I was pregnant with my first child in 2012 and this was yeah, well seven years ago it's been a long time yeah. and uh, yes mama so, <laughs> <laughs> no no <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going with that this all to you thank you so uh, <laughs> so yeah so when i had when i had her about six years ago she um a lot of the products that we needed i found that i had to import i mean dollar was cheaper then so it was easier to import um and I love the because we I wanted a certain kind of product for her things that didn't have sulfates which sulfates are bad for for African skin they dry out African skin by the way um, so there's a lot of products I wanted for her that I could only find abroad so I had to keep shipping them in and it was it, I mean having a newborn child no no nanny at the time or at least not a steady nanny yet it was very stressful managing everything and managing the home at the same time so I just thought you know it would be and I remember. Because um, I had, I happened to have have my baby in the U.S., so I remember while I was there, anything I needed, 
uh, even if I couldn't go out, I would just go online and by the next day it was delivered. And I was like, it would be nice if you know there was something where I could just do this exact same thing in Nigeria. And I just it was just a thought at that point. And um, fast forward a year later, I went to do my MBA at London Business School. And I, when I went to do my MBA, I thought I was going to go work in consulting. That was my whole mission. And after a one term, I started researching you know, life as a consultant. And I realized they work all the time. And I thought to myself, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. Little did I know that as an entrepreneur, I will work harder. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to become an entrepreneur, thinking it would be, you know, a bit more manageable since I thought I would be my own boss. Another mistake. But and I you said in the interview earlier, and one magazine, yes, I would explain. You became. Everybody yeah. became. So your the boss. thing about becoming your own boss is a big fat lie about <laughs> entrepreneurship. Everybody is your boss. Like even even the guys telling you to come on their podcast show, become your boss. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good punch. Yes, but go ahead with the story. So Don't worry. Your customers, your 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 stakeholders, your investors, your employees, everybody is now your boss. So hmm, watch out. I want to be entrepreneur. So um, back to the story. So I am. Um, I now then realized, you know, um, I wanted to do business. I wanted to do to start something. I didn't know what to start. Um, took a few courses on entrepreneurship, and I just started doing a lot of soul searching. And then I remembered this problem I'd had when I had my first child, um, and I started at, at this point. I happened to be pregnant again, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I started to do some uh, market research. So market research for me at that point was talking to actual moms, finding out how much they spent, talking to. Um, potential suppliers and see if they would be interested in supplying to Africa, understanding the needs of the mom, like how does she decide what to buy, how does she decide how much to spend, all of that. And that evolved into Mom Spring. I mean, there was other names that I tried, but I eventually landed on Mom Spring as the name of the concept. And um, we launched the website, the e-commerce store in 2016, April. And yeah, that's how Mom Spring started. Um, when my second child was born, she happened to be born not breathing and had to be in a neonatal ICU. That mm. journey led me to start to understand um, the issues around when a baby is born sick or needing help. And that's what led to me learning about newborn death and realizing that every day in Nigeria, we lose over 520 babies in Africa as a whole. Every single minute, two babies die. So it's a big problem. In Africa, we lose oh, wow, almost 1.2 million babies every year. And according to the World Health Organization, 80% of those deaths are preventable. So it's a huge problem. Uh, it's not just in Africa. Even African communities abroad, they, um, like even in the U.S., they tend to experience more newborn death than their Caucasian counterparts, mostly because apparently globally, African women women of African descent tend to just get less um, prenatal care. Either we start um, a bit later in the in the journey, or when we go, we, we're not as open as uh, as to what we're facing and what we're experiencing. So, um, so it's and that brought on the burden, and that's how Mom Spring has been evolving. That's how the foundation came about when that happened with my child, and yes, yeah, so that's how we became an e-commerce store and a foundation. As we were doing the e-commerce store, we started to get a lot of people asking, you know, do you have a store? I want to come and see stuff before I decide. So early 2019, January, actually, we launched a brick and mortar store, which, to be honest, when I first started the business, I had no idea I would ever do brick and mortar because I just thought we have to go full technology driven. And But also I knew that e-commerce is still in early stages in Africa, in Nigeria. So we said, you know, well, let's test it out. Let's see if people prefer brick and mortar. So we tried it out. It was, it's been great. Um, even now that. I will explain why, but now that we've decided to stop the brick and mortar store for now, we've had a few customers even still come in, even this week, and say, is this really going away? What are we going to do when this goes away? And I'm like, you just shop online, it's easier. Um, so what we've, in the year that we've had the brick and mortar store, we've learned a few things. So yes, Nigerians like to shop in store. However, on the flip side, um, some of our most valuable customers are extremely busy, like extremely busy. So the, the people who spend the most with us probably have been to our store like once and after that they shop on, on the website on whatsapp so then we started to think well if if you know i don't know if you heard of i'm sure you have heard about the Pareto principle 80 20 yeah. so if 80 percent of our income is coming from 20%. this 20 percent that never show up um 
Why are we spending so much to maintain this other eighty percent? Yeah, that's that's the real boss. So we just (laughs) had to adapt to the needs of our real boss. So what we're doing is taking the resources that we have spent on rent to really optimize our technology and our app because they have more needs beyond just products to really optimize for them so that we become their solution um, as mothers. Because as a mom, it's like you're still a woman. People forget uh, you're still a woman. You're still an entrepreneur or a working woman. You still have other needs beyond being a mom. You're still a lot of things. You just added another thing to your many jobs and many hats. So what Mothering is evolving to become is helping you manage all these hats, helping you still maintain your zen while you juggle all these balls that you're supposed to as an African woman. And that is the evolution of Mom Spring. I think we should take a, a whipping or sobbing break a little bit about the story of the child and all that. And then continue the story afterward. You want to cry with me? Um, sure. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to, you see. I don't think so. You will soon ask me to pay you a bill for Yet crying. another boss. Can you see what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> another crying bill. <laughs> All right. Well, it's amazing, you know, listening to your story. I mean, how it evolved and what you experimented with shows the kind of person you are. You're stronger than you appear. You're, you know, you're, it's bad, it's bad, bad news for anyone who judges you by just your, you know, your. No, actually it works in my favor. I know. Because what I usually do is, you know, sometimes people say, you know, you have to come on really strong. Otherwise people won't take you seriously. I'm like, it's fine. If they underestimate me, so they don't see me coming, it's okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why I said it's bad news for them. Good news for you. All right, let's talk about the MomSpring app right now. Sure. Now, into that, um, who was the developer behind that? Okay, so we have a partnership with a um, with a company here in Lagos to, that that um, that helps us develop our software. Okay. okay. Yeah, and we we. We'll probably end up because of the number of, because we've got new versions of this app coming out in 2020 and the SMS app, we're likely to now be expanding our development team a bit. So that's part of why we had to optimize resource management is or resource allocation is we need to really focus on helping these women that we're trying to help. And, um, and that's going to, the only way we can do it in a scalable fashion is technology. You can't, even if you have a hundred brick and mortar stores they're just limited to where they are exactly whereas technology will reach you anywhere that's right all right now let's talk about the biggest challenge that you've had with running the app itself because it's one thing to publish an app management of the app is probably the biggest challenge you're going to because it's an everyday job now the app becomes your boss yes <laughs> so the funny thing is a lot of people have been reaching out to me you're closing the store so what are you going to be doing and i'm like you don't understand my work just tripled with this app like this app is taking over my life like if i even if we even kept the store we might not have had time for the stores and that might have caused another problem in itself and we're a young brand we need to really be you know be strong on all touch points so all hands are focused on the app right now because, I mean, there's so from the so the first few days where it's you know there's weird behavior on that because there's something with technology. No matter how long you test for and how, what you try to optimize for, something will just not work out right once it goes live. Some bugs, so, yeah, some something will just so those initial days of just debugging and fix, you know, figuring out what was wrong, um, and then you know getting the app stable. And so those were the initial challenges. And then the next thing was, you know, getting users, getting word out there, pushing campaigns and all of that. So it's um, it's amazing. But even it's been great because we've been getting good feedback. We've been getting really, really in-depth feedback. It's been great um, from our beta users and even our live users. It's um, funny enough, <laughs> also increased sales on our websites. Yeah, because, it should. Yeah, because there's now been more awareness and we have... Uh, a baby list that you can create through the app. So that's created a lot more um, awareness of what we're doing. So it looks like this decision is the good. right one. It's looking good. <laughs> it's looking okay. Dear Startup Corner, today I come to talk with you about my situation. I have ideas, and I mean really great ideas that will solve a lot of problems for other people. I also want to make profit and make myself proud. I have already started But please, dear Startup Corner, I need you to help me tell my story, profile my business, and help me keep the money. 
Thank you. All right. So let's talk about um, the papers. Yes. Um, after having gone through all of these and you're doing this right now, um, how much money have you made? How much money have we made? Yeah. What do you mean? The app. From the app? Yeah. Um, so today, the only our only monetization strategy from the app has been product today. Because okay. we're not, we've not yet started selling anything directly on the app. Okay. Um, the initial strategy for the app is for the first six months is to just get users on board, drive engagement, keep optimizing for our users. So our users have been asking for like, there's two features we've been getting from literally every user we've been getting requested. So our plan is, you know, build that, learn from them, just please them, delight them, and then we can work on Monetary. transactional piece of it. Okay. <laughs> Do you at any point in time plan to sell the app itself to, you know... Oh, like what's the extra strategy? Pay, pay to... No, not that, not that. No. Oh, okay. Oh, Oh, is that what you're asking? Oh, no, no, I'm asking? Is no, that no, what you're no, asking? I'm not trying to ask. No, I'm just asking. Oh, are, you, are you trying to ask me to ask that? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, uh, you know, it's a free app, free to download app right now. It's a free. It's a free. It's always going to be free to download. Oh, that. So the strategy will even when we there's even when there's paid options, it will always be freemium. So it would always be free to download. All the core features would always be free. So it's maybe when you um so for example Q1 2020 we're looking at creating some upgradable content so if so right now we give you general advice on what to expect during your pregnancy in terms of your nutrition diet but if you now want let's say some people have something called gestational diabetes which is diabetes that happens just during the pregnancy yeah. so they're worried about how to eat what they can eat what's safe we are working with a clinical nutritionist to come up with different diet Plan. options yeah. so they can purchase that and if they want to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with someone like that they can mm -hmm. pay for that. So this, so those are the kinds of things that we're coming with. But now is, so that this was our thought. So a few months ago, those were our thoughts that we could make money this way, but we don't know yet. But now that we have actual users, we're now asking them, what would you like to see? How much would you pay for it? Right. And based on that insight, we can price properly and push it out. So on a rough um, estimate right now, about how many users uh, do you have right now? I mean, as of now, I think we're getting close to 500. But we, what we're doing is we plan campaigns. So December is kind of an interesting time in Lagos. It's all about the festivals and the concerts. So for December, we're laying low. Uh, but come January, we're planning a bunch of marketing campaigns to drive that. Because next year, you know, whether my team likes it or not, I, I want us to get to 100k users on the app. That's possible. Yeah. Totally doable. Yeah. Ask me later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, here's the part of the, of the uh, show that I usually like the most. The part where there's a lot of persons listening to you right now and thinking, oh, oh my God, I wanted to start that thing that you started now. So I, I had the idea where I couldn't get it started. Yeah, I've had conversations with people that are like, oh my God, I thought about that. Wow, you're, you're actually doing it? And, then, and there are those who feel that, well, I wish I could do something like this for this kind of group of audience, you know, in this market. Yes. But they just don't know what is, what to expect when they get started. So what advice would you give to the younger you? So the younger me um, won't spend as, will not spend too much time thinking. We'll spend more time asking questions and even starting something. So I think, so starting something doesn't mean you have to build the app. Everybody's journey is a bit different. At least for us, um, we started out with proving the business model. Like, okay, women will buy products. So now let's build technology around that and then drive more people to buy products. But you could start in the reverse. You could first build something small, if that's what you have. Use whatever um, whatever you're good at or whatever resources you have available to you to test the market, even if it's just asking questions. And then just know, okay, oh, if I give you this, will you pay for it? No problem. What some people even do to start a business sometimes, especially if you need to build a product, you can always get someone to say, okay, if in six months' time I can deliver a product that will do X, Y, and Z, Will you sign a contract like to pay this amount for it if it meets all these requirements? And if they sign that, you can even use that contract to raise money because now you already have a customer. So you don't necessarily have to have millions or hundreds of thousands to start. I think you just need to have the drive to um, even the, the power of influence that it takes to convince someone to become your customer yeah. is huge. So, yeah. Just start where you are. All right. So to connect with you across all social media handles, you know, and um, and Monstering app, what what where can we download it right now? So it's available on the Play Store right now. Um, okay. In time for Christmas, 
it will be available on the iOS store. Oh, great. That's our Christmas gift to you. Oh, great. <laughs> and then on Instagram, we're at Momspring HQ. So that's Momspring HQ, like headquarters. Uh, on Twitter, we're at Momspring. And that's it. Okay. All right. It's really nice having you here. I'll be so loud to you. I wanted to ask you before, I think I have off, off the radio. I, I thought when I, every time I hear Uditola, I'm always thinking there's only one Uditola. But now I know that there are probably others. I mean, you don't know the Tola that I know, so I'm, I'm guessing you are part of the others. <laughs> they was, must be the others. That was my punch <laughs> back at you. All right, so I thought I was going to pick it back at you on that one. All right, it's really nice having you here anyways. Great being here. All right, so that's the best time on the Startup Corner. See you again on the next one. I'm God's baby. Tell the story. Profile the business. Keep the money. Startup Corner. 